Today's webinar is the first in a series regarding the Highway Safety Manual presented by the Florida Department of Transportation. Today's webinar is an introduction to the Highway Safety Manual and HSM fundamentals. Good morning, my name is Jack Freeman and welcome to this webinar training. I am a senior principal with Kittleson and Associates in Orlando, Florida. My contact information is shown on this slide and please feel free to contact me individually after this webinar with any questions you may have that we have not sufficiently answered during the course of the webinar. This is interactive training meant to be part lecture and part workshop. The best way to learn concepts is to work example problems and we hope that the ones we have set up reinforce the learning objectives. This is a nine part webinar series that builds on itself and participation in all of them is encouraged. Following the webinars, advanced HSM workshops focused on applying concepts from the webinars to real world example problems will take place in winter 2017 and spring 2017. The advanced workshops will be held over four days with each day focused on a specific transportation field. These include planning, PD&E, design alternatives, exceptions and variations, traffic operations and highway lighting justification. All four workshops will be held in different parts of the state to hopefully get participants in the different regions. Some learning objectives of webinar one are listed here. Mainly this webinar is a primer for the rest of the webinar series and will hopefully give you good background information as to why safety and HSM is important. These learning objectives include why is safety important, what is the HSM, what is predictive safety and why is it important, how is safety measured, crash data analysis overview, predicted method overview, and how can the predicted slash expected number of crashes be used. So now we'd like to take a few minutes to learn about our audience. And the first is a series of poll questions we would like to do. Please state the organization type where you work. And there are different items on the screen from which you to choose. The second poll question is to please state your past experience using the Highway Safety Manual. And again, you'll see a series of questions for which you can answer. And the third one is regarding your accessibility. Do you have access to the HSM? And again, there are a series of responses for which you can answer. So now I'd like to move into the first learning objective that we've talked about and why is safety important. Nationally we have seen a decline in the number of uh, total fatalities by year from approximately 43,000 in 2005 to approximately 33,000 in 2014. And while there has been an approximate 25 percent decrease, still 33,000 fatalities annually is too many. The goal we strive for as transportation professionals is zero deaths on our roadways. Now I'd like to do another poll question and the question is how many fatalities occurred in the state of Florida in 2014 and you see three potential answers. So. The answer to the question is 2,494 and as shown in the chart, Florida has experienced just under 2,500 fatalities in 2014, which is approximately 7.5% of the national fatalities observed in 2014. The Florida Strategic Highway Safety Plan has established goals to reduce fatalities and serious injuries by 5% per year. The graph you see before you uh, shows the number of fatalities in blue and the number of serious injuries in red and their future goals. And the left axis represents the number of fatalities and the right axis in red shows 
uh, the number of serious injuries and it of course is moving across uh, using uh, the number of years. So you can see by in the range of uh, 2016 to 2020 we're our goal is to have 1,789 fatalities average for that five-year period. But crashes are rare events. Crashes represent only a small portion of events that occur on a transportation system. For example, for a crash to occur, we need a vehicle or at least one more object, whether it's fixed or moving, to arrive at the same point at the same time. However, the driver may break in time and the other driver may slow down and so on. If the crash does not occur, the severity of the crash will vary dependent on factors such as speed of the crash, the age and health of the drivers, as well as a function of safety protective measures available in the car. Here you're seeing a Venn diagram that is showing various contributing crash factors. Uh, these include human factors, road environment factors, and vehicle factors. And uh, you probably already figured out that these don't total up to 100%. They're well over 100%. And what you're looking at is the, looking at the contributing causes of a crash. And if we know the contributing factors of a crash, we can review alternatives to reduce the risk of that crash occurring again. It is difficult to know the specific cause of a crash or and excuse me, it's difficult to know the specific cause of a crash and most crashes cannot be contributed to a single contributing factor. Instead, the crash is a result of a convergence of a series of events influenced by a number of different contributing factors. So as we move into looking at how this relates to what we do in design, ASHTO has provided guidance for a number of years that basically advises designers to say the consistent adherence to minimum design criteria values is not advisable. Minimum design criteria may not ensure adequate levels of safety in all situations. And this was even recognized back in the 1997 Highway Safety Design and Operations Guide saying the challenge to a designer is to achieve the highest level of safety within the physical and financial constraints of a project. So we've known this for a number of years and we start looking at ways to be able to design for it. So as, lo as we look at the lines of defense of a well-designed highway, we see, see a number of different ways we can do this. It includes uh, using reflective pavement markings, skid resistant pavement to clear signing and appropriate speed limits, edge treatments such as profile therm thermoplastic or rumble strips, a paved shoulder, guardrails help reduce runoff the road crashes. These treatments all have measurable safety effects. The next section is what is the HSM and looking at the HSM, well, it really has uh, two dimensions. We've had for a number of years our different standards compliance documents. The the ASHTO Green Book shown here, the MUTCD, are examples of standards compliance documents. We also have new documents out such as the Highway Safety Manual. And the Highway Safety Manual gets us into what's known as expected or actual crash frequency and severity and looking at that in, in different terms. As we look at the definition of substantive safety, it's taking a normally safe street or highway, next slide, and the application of highway research and results. Taking that, combining it with performance monitoring, we are looking at what is a substantially safe street or highway. Looking at it graphically and the kinds of safety, safety is, has often been taken, shown by, and represented by the blue line as an absolute. I go in, I provide, and I apply a certain countermeasure, and I get a certain reduction. But as we look at safety uh, and look at substantive safety, we are looking at a series of different types of uh, countermeasures that we can apply to a particular situation. These could be lane width. These could be enhance the radius of a curve. This could be improving sight distance. 
different types of options that bring that into more of a, a curve and not a linear type comparison as we look at safety improvements. The Highway Safety Manual is, is very akin to the Highway Capacity Manual, a document many of us have used for many years. It is similar in, in several regards. First, it is a definitive and represents a quality quantitative state-of-the-art information. It is widely accepted and used within the professional practice of tra transportation engineering, and it is science-based and updated regularly to reflect research. In fact, the Highway Safety Manual is currently going through an update, and we'll talk more about that later in this webinar. The Highway Safety Manual is divided into four parts and each part has its own respective different uh, objecti objectives and covers different topics. It has a total of 19 chapters. Uh, today's webinar is focused on the fundamentals of the Highway Safety Manual and can be found in Part A. Part B is Roadway Safety Management. Part C is Predictive Method. It has five different predictive chapters in it. And Part D is Crash Modification Factors. We will cover each of these parts through this webinar series. The next section is why is predictive safe, what is predictive safety, excuse me, and why is it important? As we've looked at different types of analysis and looking at project level decisions over the years, we've been able to get into great detail on things like traffic noise modeling and my micro simulation and macroscopic traffic operations analysis, environmental assessments and doing detailed cost analysis. We have not been able to do the same with the uh, more quantitative type assessment for safety. Uh, now with the Highway Safety Manual, we have that ability to go to and use and do quantitative type assessment, known as substantive safety as we've discussed. So it allows us to equally consider safety along with the other types of an array of issues that come up in the, the evaluation of a project. Comparatively evaluate with cost, environment, mobility, right away, and go through and quantitatively be able to evaluate these different types of trade-offs in making project decisions. So as we look at how safety is measured, it's important to be able to consider the different classifications of how safety is. Highway Safety Manual has four, five different categories of crashes within the manual. The first is K, which is a fatality uh, and a fa fatal crash. It's a person, one or more persons have died within 30 days of the crash and it is registered as a fatal crash. The second types of crashes are injury crashes which are A, in, incapacitating injury, B, non-incapacitating in, evident injury, and C is a possible injury. The last type is the O crash, which has no injuries, but reportable property damage report, resulting from the crash. Some local jurisdictions report these crashes on short form crash forms and are not in the FDOT crash management system. In crash severity, the most severe injury that occurs at the crash controls the crash severity reported for, this, for the particular incident. So, another poll question. Where can you find the crash severity distribution by FDOT facility type? And you see three potential answers. So the answer is, it's in the plan, FDOT plans preparation manual and it is shown here for the different CABCO crash distributions. Uh, and it is broken down by different types of facility types. This table is table 23.5.4, uh, located in chapter 23, volume one of the FDOT plans preparation manual. As we look at crash data, it has, it can have a number of different limitations. These limitations include the quality and, uh, and accuracy, 
different reporting thresholds, different severity definitions, and difference among jurisdictions. Differences exist among jurisdictions in how crashes are reported and classified. This influences studies where data from different jurisdictions are used, classifications between juris jurisdictions, and where models are used across jurisdictions. In terms of death, the typical reporting period is 30 days. However, this implies that an agency is actually checking for deaths occurring after the crash within a, within a death certificate data. It is not occurring, then it's likely that the number of motor vehicle related crashes are underreported. So, crashes, it's important in crashes to consider regression to the mean. But let's first look at a definition of regression to the mean. If you roll a dice twice, th what is the average you would expect? But if you expect to see 3.5 in just two rolls, probably not. But if you continue to roll the dice, it, and more than likely the cumulative average of the results will equal 3.5. The phenomenon of the average of, di of the dice in converging on a long-term average is the roll of the dice that you call regression to the mean. Crash frequency at a site normally varies up and down over the long term, assuming nothing else changes and regresses to a long-term average. In the HSM, we are using long-term expected crash frequency as the quantitative measure of safety. The long-term expected average crash frequency is expressed as expected average crashes per year. As with rolling the dice, the short-term average crash frequency that we often use as a measure of the site's performance is not necessarily a good indicator of long-term crash frequency because the average as shown here could be high or low as compared to the long-term expected average. If we use more years of crash data to estimate the average, we would likely calculate a number closer to the long-term average expected crash frequency. Again, this is regression to the mean. Another issue associated with regression to the mean relates to selecting sites for improvement and measuring the effectiveness of a particular treatment. In Two to four years, our crash frequencies are increasing every year. As a result, a particular site is selected based on the short term toward upward trend. Because of regression to the mean, it is probable that the crashes will, without treatment, decrease during the following years. We all, if we applied a treatment to the site that in reality reduced the number of crashes because of the treatment, we cannot attribute the entire reduction to observed crashes on the treatment alone. Some of this is attributable to regression to the mean. We used the empirical Bayes process in before and after studies to account for regression to the mean. And here in this slide, slide you can see the actual reduction due to the treatment. One more quick. The actual reduction due to the treatment and its overall uh, effectiveness of the improvement. So, in summary, with regression to the mean, if we don't count for regression to the mean, we really can't say that the crash difference is due to the improvement or the treatment done. So, another polling question. What is the minimum number of years of crash data that should be analyzed for a location? You have three different selections below. So now let's look at some of the ways that we analyze crashes and one of the historic ways that we've done for many years is uh, use of crash rates. And this has been a very traditional method to measure uh, crash treatment effectiveness. It is looking at the average crash frequency in a time period uh, divided by the exposure and it, where exposure is defined as the million vehicles miles traveled or for an intersection, the million vehicles entering the intersection. It has a number of advantages. It's easy for 
the public to understand crash rates. It's easier for them to accept it because it's intuitive. Um, and it had, it was one of those limited analysis methodologies we had before the Highway Safety Manual. But it's also got a number of limitations. It's based solely on historic crash data. It assumes that the, there's a linear relationship between crash frequency and exposure. And we've seen through research that the relationship between crashes and exposure is usually nonlinear. So uh, it, as we start predicting in the future, it's not really showing how crashes will occur in the future. Let's look at an example. Um, here is an example of crash crashes and ADT recorded over a eight year time period. For the four, first four years, the average crash rate was 2.28. But then we had a new development that came in in 1992. And as a result of that new development, the travel on the roadway increased dramatically. Crashes didn't increase quite as much as in literally with the ADT, and therefore the crash rate went down. And the average crash rate over the next four years was 1.24. So let's look in a little bit more in depth of how this does and the influence of really low ADT on crash rates and what, what happens. So in summary, again, we had the before development rate of 2.28, but there really were no changes in the roadway alignment, the roadway cross-section, everything remained the same. Just we had the after development, in this case the development was a casino with an average rate of 1.2, and the average crash rate went down 1.24. But there were a couple of things other than looking at crash rate that are really important in the analysis of the crash data. The percent of alcohol-related crashes increased by 500%. And the crash rate and looking at that crash rate reduction, which may have shown an improvement, doesn't really support the overall crash problem that has occurred uh, in this particular corridor. Moving on to the predictive method and giving you a quick overview of the predictive methods, which we'll discuss in much greater uh, detail as we move into uh, future webinars. So now let's give an overview of the uh, predictive method, something we'll discuss in great detail as we move into future webinars. The definition of the predictive method is to estimate the expected average crash frequency given a specific geometric design, traffic volumes, and a given time period. This method can be used to compare the quantitative safety effects of an alternative cross-sections or traffic operations treatments that are, un are under consideration. So there are two definitions of what we call predicted and expected crashes. The first is predicted crashes, which is an estimate of long-term average frequency, which is forecast to occur at a location using the predictive models found in Part C of the HSM. So these are based upon long-term models that are in the Highway Safety Manual. The other is expected crashes, which is also based upon the long-term average crash frequency of a location given a, with a given set of geometric conditions, traffic volumes, ADT, but it also considers observed crash data, what we will refer to quite frequently in here as the empirical Bayes or EB method. It basically takes in and adds in observed crash data over a period of years and really helps to bring forth that regression to the mean that we just talked about later and makes a more accurate pre prediction of future crashes. We'll talk more about that as we go through this overall webinar. So let's look at what are the data requirements that we have to have to be able to go through and do the predicted analysis. Uh, it requires a Crash data and you know, data on crashes, it requires facility data, and it also requires traffic volume data, and we have to get in there. And some of the information for facility data usually includes the type of roadway, the functional classification, um, the number of lanes, shoulder width, presence of median, segment length. These are all different types of facility data. And the Highway Safety Manual for Traffic Volume uses AADT 
as the volume and usually a very readable, easily to obtain type of information for a facility. As we go through and look at the elements of the predictive method, we see three basic functions that are in the predictive part of it, which are safety performance functions, which we'll refer to as SPFs quite frequently in this webinar series. Crash modification factors, we'll also refer to as CMFs as we go through this. A calibration factor, and the calibration factor is a local factor, uh, and they have been developed for Florida, and we use that to adjust for local conditions. And then the empirical Bayes method. If we have observed crash data, if we have crash data, we will go through and apply this to be able to obtain that expected average crash frequency that we just spoke about. So as you look at the equation and being able to go through that predicted average crashes, the SPF basically formula for in predicted is the SPF times the number of crash modification factors that you have times the local calibration factor. And it's important to note that you, when you're in an SPF and using the Part C equations, you will use the number of crash modification factors that are shown in the equation and for the part that you're you, part of the HSM that you're using. Safety performance functions are really a development of a mathematical modeling process and it is a mathematical expression. The important part is, is, is that it can estimate crashes based upon a crash frequency based upon a base condition and it looks at different types of base conditions and what is that base condition to be able to develop. It could be 12 foot lanes, it could be 6 foot shoulders, it could be no lighting. These are different types of base conditions that we have in different SPFs. There are a number of SPFs that have been developed for the Highway Safety Manual in Part C. Uh, this gives you a good idea. There's segment SPFs in Rule 2 Lane. Uh, there's just one segment SPF. In m m Rule Multi Lane, there's two. Rule, uh, two SPFs, one for divided, one for undivided. And then as we get to urban and suburban arterials, there are five. And we'll talk more about those later as we get into those chapters. There's also SPFs developed for intersection, three-legged and four-legged intersections, with signal stop control, different types of SPFs. So you have a total of eight, 18 SPFs in chapters 10 through 12 of the Highway Safety Manual. <coughs> In chapters 18 and 19, which were more recently re released for freeways and ramps, you have many more uh, safety performance functions. 28 different segment level SPFs uh, for freeways. And you've got also SPFs for ramp entrances, ramp exits, uh, different types of collector distributor roads, uh, different types of different facilities have safety performance functions. In these two chapters, we have a total of 138 safety performance functions uh, representing these, and there are uh, different situations for different numbers of lanes, uh, different types of uh, you know calibrations. So as we go through that, and we'll talk about those later in uh, webinars seven and eight of this series. Crash modification factors, which is another important part of that predictive equation. It represents the relative change in crash frequency due to a change in one specific condition while all other conditions and characteristics remain constant. Important that all other conditions and characteristics remain constant. So that it's that one change as you look at implementing a treatment or countermeasure. Crash modification factors are another important element uh, and the equation for this is shown as the ratio of the crash frequency under two different conditions, where condition A is the change from the base or existing condition, and condition B is that base or existing condition, and it's the ratio between the two. CMS may serve as an estimate of the effect of a particular geometric design change or traffic control on the effectiveness of a particular condition treatment. You should only apply a CMF 
when the following base conditions are known. The setting and the road type and what type of uh, facility do you have. The ADT range because different crash modification factors have ADT ranges. And the crash type and severity. Different CMFs and crash modifications only address certain types of crashes and certain uh, crash types. So you need to know and be aware of those different conditions. The third element of the overall predictive equation is the calibration factor. And is to adjust the, the predictive models to local conditions, to local climate, to driver populations, animal populations, different types of crash reporting thresholds, and looking at different reporting procedures. And it is based upon the, cali the, the calibration factors based upon the total observed crashes divided by the total predictive crashes. So if the, uh, if the calibration factor is equal to one, then the two are equal. If it's greater than one, then the observed crashes are greater more than the predictive crashes uh, for that particular state. Florida has developed and refined the calibration factors uh, used in the state of Florida. And these are found in the highway safety or in, and let me start all over again. And these are found in the plans preparation manual table 23.5.3 and the different types of calibration factors. It's important to note that the calibration factors for uh, intersections have been recently updated or reflected here. So a question to the audience. If a crash modification factor is 1.1, would you expect crashes to increase or decrease? And the second part of this question is, how much would you expect the crashes to increase or decrease? So as we move forward and uh, move from more of the predicted applications to the expected applications, we get into the empirical Bayes method and, and what is that concept? Well, first of all, looking at this graph where crash frequency is on the y-axis and average daily traffic is on the x-axis, you see the safety performance function or the SPF and it has a predicted number coming from that. We also have an observed number of crashes and we're using that and we go through and each SPF will have its own individual weighting factor and its own individual over dispersion parameter to be able to calculate and go through a formula to, to develop the expected number of crashes using empirical bays. In this particular case, since the observed number of crashes were higher than the uh, predicted number, the expected is in between those two. If in the next slide, you will see that the observed crashes happens to be lower than that. And again, the, expect, the expected number using EB and the empirical based method is in between the two. So it can go higher or lower based upon the number of observed crashes you have. And it's important to note that this really does help you to go through and more finely tune and give you a more accurate prediction of the overall crash estimated as you move into future years. So let's, let's bring all this together into a summary here and looking at the reliability of the two methods. This is a graph showing here, got a lot, a lot of things, so I'll take time to explain it. Again, the, the, the y-axis is the expected crash frequency and the x-axis is ADT, average daily traffic. But here you see a series of lines. The solid line is those lines you can get from, when you look at a 95% confidence interval and the reliability of the overall crash prediction, what you get from simple SPF calculations, and that's that upper limit. And if you then apply the empirical Bayes analysis and you come in and go through and do the expected crash frequency, those da the dashed line represents that, and you see that cone tightening. We'll never, it'll never be an exact science where it's gonna be an actual number, but you can see that we're getting much greater reliability, much higher reliability with the expected value than with the predicted value. Let's talk a little bit about the way we do this and what are the empirical Bayes method equations. And here you see 
those different equations here. W, which is the weight adjustment and the weighting adjustment. And as part of that, it is the overdispersion parameter, again, which is developed for each and every SPF. It is found in the Highway Safety Manual, or if it's a local SPF, it will be provided with the SPF. And the other factor is that in predicted for all study years. So in predicted comes out of the previous SPF analysis, and you can do it if you're looking for five years. You can, you know, sum that all up for the in predicted for those five years. And that is taken into the equation to be able to calculate your in expected. So it's the weighting factor times the in predicted, uh, one minus the weighting factor, and then times the in observed. In observed is your actual number of crashes that you have on the roadway. And uh, again, is for that study period. So if you're looking at one year, five years, you can do it uh, using this equation. So, important part is you've done all this. How can you use the predicted or expected number of crashes? And how? what are some applications you can do with this? So let's look at a little bit of an example and we'll build upon this. First of all, let's look at uh, an example where you where you want to increase the lane width from 10 feet to 12 feet for a 5,000 ADT rural two-lane roadway. And looking at it, and you can see this, this happens to be the crash modification factor for a lane width with these two different types of roadway segments. So for 12 feet, you can see the crash modification factor because the uh, volume ADT happens to be a greater than 2,000, is 1.0. And for 10-foot lane, the eight crash modification factor is 1.3. So as we go, and this also, keep in mind that this isn't for all crashes. It just covers single vehicle, run off the road, multiple vehicle head-on, opposite direction sideswipe, and same direction sideswipe, and that's the note uh, up near the top of the y-axis. So if we want to do a benefit cost analysis with using this information. Uh, this is a process we need to go through. We want to estimate the changes in crashes by severity. And we want to use you know, crash history by severity and get in and use current and future ADT uh, crash modification factors and SPFs uh, where available and it is desirable to use SPFs. We also need to know the monetary value of crashes by severity, the service life and discount rate, and the uh, countermeasure implementation costs. The benefit cost analysis process is this. First of all, we estimate the change in uh, crashes and to be able to estimate and provide a, these benefits to a monetary value. The third step is to estimate the project cost. And then the final is, step is to conduct the economic evaluation. And while we'll get into this in much greater detail as we get into other webinars, um, what we'll do is give you a quick synopsis of it right now. The, uh, the first thing we need is the CABCO crash distribution by facility. In the case, just a few minutes ago, we were doing a rural two-lane undivided roadway, which is R2U. Uh, this is again located in uh, Chapter 23, Volume 1 of the Plans Preparation Manual. We also need, we need the uh, FDOT crash costs, which is also found in Volume 1, Chapter 23 of the Plans Preparation Manual, and it is, you know, the most recent crash cost uh, information found in the manual. The third is, as we look at um, being able to take benefits to present value, we would then look at the service life of the improvement and being able to take that to a uh, present worth cost uh, because we will have uh, varying ADTs for each year. Uh, we will have non-uniform annual benefits, so the non-uniform annual benefits 
uh, equation is typically the one that we use for uh, estimating present value in, in the analyses that we do. Another important part of it is the estimate of project cost. Um, you know, this is a benefit cost ratio, so this is the denominator part. These include different elements such as right of way, construction material, construction and material, maintenance and operations, and engineering and planning. And these are costs that are fairly typically done. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but this gives you an idea of those the different types of costs that we need to consider. The benefit cost ratios, again, the present value of the benefits divided by the present value of the cost. And it is typically justified if the, uh, if the benefit cost ratio is greater than one. Let's go back and look at our example that we just talked about earlier. If lane widths of a two-lane rural highway are increased from 10 to 12 feet, crashes are predicted to decrease by 2.5 crashes per year. So how do we calculate the monetary benefit of this crash reduction? And we'll do a simplified example here. First step is to be able to say that use the FDOT cab code distributions for a rural two-lane highway to be able to go through and distribute our 2.5 crash reduction across the different types of injury severity. So for example, in K, the, uh, the distribution is 0.032. That would be times 2.5, resulting in at 0.8. And you would go through that and do that. And the numbers would add up for all K, A, B, C, and O to be a total of 2.5 for the number of crashes reduced at this at study location. The second step of the crash cost calculation example is to calculate the monetary benefits of the, re in the reduction in injury crashes. So we're looking at the, again, tr transporting the column of number of injury crashes reduced at the steady location. We multiply that by the FDOT comprehensive crash cost to obtain the overall monetary benefit in reduced crashes. As we look across, let's just use the uh, cake type crash type for an example. The, Reduction in crashes would be 0.08. That would be multiplied by the 10,230,000 for a individual uh, fatality crash. And then the resultant of that is $818,400 for that particular benefit. We repeat that process for each of the crash types and the total annual uh, crash cost savings is $1,120,000 for, and that's an annual basis per year uh, crash cost savings. So, in summary for webinar one, we've covered a number of different topics uh, and we've gone through and given you a feeling for why is safety important, an introduction to the HSM and what is it about and how can you use it, uh, why is predictive safety it is important to your everyday work uh, and how is it measured uh, going through the CAPCO scale. We've gone over some of the crash data and the analysis overview. Um, we've given you a snapshot of the predictive method, a lot more yet to come in future webinars, uh, and then how can the predicted expected number of crashes be used. And again, a lot of this will focus on the economic benefits of making crash safety but also other different steps. So as I mentioned earlier, the Highway Safety Manual is moving into improvement and a, a new second edition is under development as we speak. Um, it is underway to incorporate relevant new research um, and fill gaps in technical content. For example, in the current Highway Safety Manual you have today, you do not have predictive methods for six and eight lane arterials for one-way streets. These chapters are underway and will be available uh, in fact as early as late this year, early next year. It's also to correct errors and omissions and also to improve usability and accessibility. So it's basically to allow us to 
to use the highway safety manual as a basis for making better highway safety decisions. But it's important that uh, you understand this is an update. It's not a total rewrite. So the methods you are learning today through these webinars will be applied in the future. They're not changing. We're just building upon them and we're adding more to it and providing more information uh, so it's not totally new. So as we look at the development of the new Highway Safety Manual, it's just important for you to remember it's taking the old manual, we're adding in research, we're adding in uh, you know, some of the research gaps, we're adding in user perspectives and being able to do it. We have a number of key stakeholder groups involving AASHTO, involving uh, Transportation Research Board, involving NCHRP, all coming together to be able to produce the second edition, uh, which hopefully will result in increased use and application of the manual as time goes on. The HSM uh, 2 delivery schedule is shown here. Uh, we'll step through it. Phase 1 is complete. Uh, the work program and all the different things that you see have been done. Uh, the study team is currently working on the development of the first draft. Uh, a lot of the original research will be done. Uh, a cutoff date has been established of September 2017 for all that research to be completed. And so the second and third drafts in phase three can be uh, provided. Another key element is you're seeing uh, HSM spreadsheet software. That is going to be a key part of what we're doing here. And then the final phase for delivery of the HSM sometime in 2019 is to basically finalize that get it approved. This again will be an AASHTO document uh, and will be provided uh, with more software and more uh, training materials as part of the overall development. So finally, uh, a few things for your information. Uh, what are available resources that you have? Well, the Highway Safety Manual is shown here. It must be purchased. It's available through AASHTO um, and it can be purchased uh, through their website. Uh, there are a number of other sources that are available with different types of websites that you see here. Uh, the FDOT HSM website, there's a, uh, a RATA sheet that's out for the Highway Safety Manual published in March uh, 2016. There's also uh, FDOT and uh, HSM user guides out. Uh, so those are available one through NCHRP is uh, the website shown here. Uh, there's also information in the plans preparation manual and as part of the uh, MUTS manual update there were um, the 1738 spreadsheets uh, are shown in the FDOT website there and these are being improved as part of this work uh, and enhanced so if you previously downloaded them I'd suggest you download them again because they're new and improved versions. And with that, we'll go live to answer any questions uh, submitted during the webinar or open it up to any additional questions. Thank you for listening.